Hey, this is Dr. K from my medical school, and today we're going to talk about systemic lupus erythematosus, otherwise known as SLE. So as the name suggests, SLE is a systemic autoimmune disorder that causes inflammation and affects all the major organs of the body. If you are interested in learning what you can do to help further lupus research or support advocacy for lupus patients, make sure to check out the Lupus Foundation of America at lupus.org. Since lupus is a systemic inflammatory disorder, what are the symptoms of lupus? Well, lupus commonly presents with a multitude of generalized symptoms, making the differential diagnosis quite broad. Some common general symptoms include fever, fatigue, myalgias, arthritis, and weight loss. There are additional symptoms and signs associated with lupus, and we will talk about them next as we discuss how to diagnose lupus. The most important step in understanding any disease is grasping how to diagnose the disease. So let's talk about how to diagnose lupus. There are many mnemonics that can aid in the remembering all the diagnostic criteria. The one I remember is called dopamine rash. You need to have at least four criteria met to diagnose lupus. Let's go through each one. The D represents discoid rash. A discoid rash is a disc-shaped rash that is flat but has pronounced redness at the borders. Here we have a picture that demonstrates a discoid rash. Next, we have oral ulcers. Generally, patients will have ulcers that you find incidentally on exam. The way to differentiate these ulcers from infectious ulcers is that infectious ulcers are usually painful, while ulcers from lupus are generally painless. Other skin findings include a photosensitive rash. Photosensitive means that sun exposure triggers and can worsen the skin rash. Patients do not need much sun exposure to really develop these rashes. In addition, patients may experience joint pain, otherwise known as arthralgia, or joint inflammation, known as arthritis. A classic physical exam finding for a lupus patient is the Maillard rash. The Maillard rash affects the cheeks and the bridge of the nose. In a truly classic rash, it appears in the shape of a butterfly, covering the nasal bridge and both cheeks. In addition to rashes, another criteria is immunologic phenomenon. Immunologic phenomenon include detection of anti-smooth muscle antibody, anti-double-stranded DNA, anti-Rho and anti-La, otherwise known as SSA and SSB. Finally, if lupus is drug-induced, you may see antihistone antibodies. The next criteria are neurologic phenomenon. Patients can develop altered mental status, seizures, stroke, and headache. In addition to mental status changes, lupus can damage the kidneys, causing either a nephritic or a nephrotic disorder. Nephritic disorders is when the kidney is damaged causing proteinuria, a loss of protein in the urine, with less than 3.5 grams per day. In addition, in a nephritic disorder, a patient may have high blood pressure and red blood cell casts in the urine. Nephrotic disorders is when there's a significant protein loss of greater than 3.5 grams per day in the urine. In addition, patients may have elevated cholesterol levels, low albumin levels, and peripheral edema. One of the classic tests for lupus is ANA, or anti-nuclear antibody. ANA is sensitive, but not specific, so a positive ANA does not indicate lupus, and you need to look for other criteria described by dopamine rash to make the diagnosis. Other symptoms that are characterized or seen in lupus are serositis. This includes pleuritis, pericarditis, and peritonitis. Finally, patients can have hematological phenomena. These include anemia, thrombocytopenia, and hemolytic anemia. Now that we've talked about the diagnostic criteria for lupus, let's talk about how to monitor disease activity. Lupus patients will need frequent routine labs to monitor disease activity. Key labs include C3, C4, and CH50. These labs test the complement system. When lupus is highly active, it leads to consumption of complement factors. In addition, a rise in the IgG anti-double-strand DNA indicates an increase in disease activity. In addition to monitoring disease activity, as we know, lupus can cause kidney damage. One indicator of proliferative glomerulonephritis is a drop in your C1Q complement. The next important step into understanding lupus is understanding treatment. One of the most important factors in decreasing disease activity is to stop smoking. Smoking has been linked to worsening disease activity and worse outcomes. Like I mentioned before, lupus patients should be monitored with frequent labs. These labs include CBC, an ESR or estimated sedimentation rate, CRP or C-reactive protein, urinalysis, spot urine and creatinine, CH50, C3, C4, and anti-double-strand DNA. In terms of actual therapy, the first step is to begin with NSAIDs. 
If NSAIDs do not control symptoms, and they rarely do, hydroxychloroquine can be used. Hydroxychloroquine is an anti-malarial medication and has been shown to prevent damage to the central nervous system and kidneys in lupus. If these symptoms continue to persist and major organs are being affected, systemic corticosteroids should be administered. Finally, if these therapies do not work, the patient needs to be escalated to methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, and azathioprine for better system control. Well, this was a brief review of systemic lupus erythematosus. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please share this video with your friends on Facebook and Twitter. Give this video a like, place any comments or suggestions down below, and most importantly, subscribe.